and we're going to review quickly if you were out last week so that we can pick up right where we left off. We were talking about unity last week and what Lucifer's problem was is that he wouldn't stay in his office and Korah rebelled in the Old Testament wilderness and uh, he wasn't happy with uh, the freedom that he had and he confronted Moses and demanded a more significant role. The result was judgment. Miriam, we know that she became unhappy and she spoke out against Moses and she contracted leprosy. God takes very seriously violations of unity based on self-assertion. And so as Lucifer was sure he had the bait to entice Jesus and we all know about um, how he tempted the Lord um, trying to force his hand, but Christ rejected Satan's offer. So when Jesus left the earth, he set into place five offices. This is part of getting into our message tonight. Those uh, offices were apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And the purpose was to mature the church and bring it to a place of unity. And we're going to be talking about prayer, and we're going to see how critical uh, unity is to the church in our prayer life. The stability and the wholeness of the church is the greatest testimony that we have. Uh, it could be said that it's the greatest form of evangelism that we have because by the love one for each other, you'll know that they're my disciples, he said. So the experience of unity rises out of humility. As a unified church in community, it attracts the glory of God. Uh, the force of unity is felt only under the hand of authority. And so we understand and know that it, in order for us to be unified, we must practice humility. And so uh, it must learn to flow together as do the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, none duplicating the other, each deferring to the other. And only when the church is unified by the process of humility and then mobilized will it be a force in this world. And then the church is together in one place in one accord over in Acts, the second chapter, said suddenly there comes a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind. What happened? The Holy Spirit had come into that unity or that condition of unity. And so it required them to be where the Lord told them to be. And while they were there, they were in one accord praying and worshiping. And that's when the Holy Spirit came in. So we see the tremendous role there that unity played. Then Acts, that was Acts 2. And in Acts 4, the churches again together in worship and they were praying and it was so powerful that the place where they were at was shaken you know you've heard stories of, of uh, wonderful worship services where great things took place and I've been in some of those and I can remember even as a little girl uh, the adults talking about how you know it looks smoky in the church and uh, I've seen you know evangelists run and just step on the backs of the pews and they won't bolt it down but the pews didn't turn over and he didn't fall he looked like he was walking on water to this little child and so we see that the place where we are will be shaken if we are in unity amen and then over in Acts 6, division comes to the church. And when it did, the expansion, the growth of the church um, came to a screeching halt. And uh, it became uh, a self-centered and uh, self-controlling church. But it was only when the leadership of the city turns back to God. And how did they do that? And it says in a delib deliberate action of prayer and seeking God that again they were able to do what the church, the body of God's believers, are supposed to do. Only then could the church be the church. And it took them to do a deliberate act of prayer and asking the Lord to heal the division that was among them. Matthew 12, 25, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and any city or house divided against itself shall not stand. So then we jump to Acts 12. Peter was in prison under threat of execution. And what was the church doing? They were where they were supposed to be doing what they were called to do. They were praying. 
God sends an angel and leads Peter out of prison, sparing his life. I'm going to ask Pastor Hudson to give us his definition of prayer that he told us so many times. Prayer is... And don't we need him to intervene in our affairs? Amen. So that's the reason we pray. And we think, you know, we talk a lot, especially in, uh, in uh, Sunday school, we talk a lot about studying the Bible and reading the Word, and that is so important. But Sister Maria, we need to pray. We need to talk to the Lord, and we need to empty our hearts out to Him. And so the church is praying and God sends an angel and he leads Peter out of prison, sparing his life. Now when something tremendous like that happens to you, sometimes you don't understand and know why it happened like it did. You don't understand the circumstances. You don't know what's going on. You know, I remembered uh, and I think about my cancer and all I could think about was how unworthy I was for God to do a miracle for me when so many others were so desperately sick. I remember sitting in the waiting room one day for some further testing and uh, a couple of uh, patients came in and they had no hair on their head and they could barely walk and and here I am and I've just been told a week or so earlier that it was either lymphoma or a Hodgkin's and uh that I, the patient had a mass in the right lung metastasized in the liver and spleen and I'm sort of thinking well it's checkout time and I look up and I see the visible effects of what they say was going to happen to my body when you look at it from the medical diagnosis and yet God heard prayer and God delivered and that was in 1996 am I worthy no I'm not but God does answer prayer and God sent an angel for Peter and delivered him out of prison and spared his life Acts 13 as the church in Antioch ministers to the Lord again an atmosphere of unity was evidenced it was evidenced how by their worship unity and worship so God speaks and the apostolic ministry of Barnabas and Paul are set forth and so they prayed over them and anointed them before they left to go on their missionary trip so we see here in this atmosphere of unity there was worship we also read in Acts 16, Paul and Silas are in jail, and uh, the two of them began to worship and pray. The result of that unity expressed in worship is powerful. There's a lot of things these guys could have done when they were in jail. They could have moaned and groaned and sat there, and why me, Lord, and I don't deserve this, and why have I got to go through this problem? But instead, they were worshiping the Lord. And through their worship, that unity of spirit was seen, and God delivered them. He shook the jailhouse, he loosed the stocks and the bonds, and not only from Paul and Silas, but from the others as well. What would it take to loose the shackles from those who were imprisoned in our cities? And then the question from Doug Small was, what will it take to loose the church? Itself shackled and unable to respond to the needs of the church. And into that unity, God will deposit his glory. So we know that when we are the church, operating as he left the church, then he will deposit his glory and he will answer our prayers. Um, so we have rightly understood the gospel as a message of holiness and righteousness and Luther violated the relational order of heaven and chose not to stay within his place Adam and Eve did not violate the moral order of God by eating of the forbidden fruit they violated the relational order uh, they had their rights and their privileges that set bounds for them, uh, but they violated God's order. So the gospel of reconciliation demands not only moral wholeness, but relational wholeness. So the gospel we preach calls men to holiness and righteousness. And finally, from last week's lesson, unity is reestablished with the intentional movement away from division and independence back towards God 
one human at a time. And Luke 15 and 10 says, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Let's don't forget that joy. They might have joy, but the Bible tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And when we see things happen in the altars, when we see things happen on the saints of God, knowing that God is healing and delivering and doing awesome, mighty things amongst our midst, how can we not have the joy of the Lord bubble up and help us when we worship? There are times when we began worship service that I'm already, I've done give 110% of what I thought I had over in Sunday school, I teach hard as I can. But when I walk in here, I'm like, I'm tired. I even got to where I was bringing me a banana to eat in between. Man, I need some something another, something another to help me. You know, but I found out that if I would just lift it on up there and get it up and get that antenna, something would happen to me. It might not do nothing to nobody else, but when I got my antenna up, all of a sudden the physical tiredness went away. This old 70-something body stood up and began to worship her creator because of all he's done for me. You see, I can't even repay him for all he did for me, let alone what he's done for all of you. So we've got a lot of worshiping to catch up on. Amen. So then chapter 11, we get into prayer and incense. We got 500 things to do. The tyranny of the urgent, pressures multiplied, and it seems that we never get to the end of our to-do list. I don't know if you are a list maker or not. Uh, Brother Herring is not. But uh, if, you have a, if you may have the type of personality that you make a list and you check those things off as you're going down the list. So if somebody comes along and says, why don't you spend an hour in prayer, you think to yourself, what? You know, I'm busy. I've got uh, 500 things to do. Do we work or worship? If we have to preach in 30 minutes, do we study or do we pray? If people are pressing into the house to see Jesus, this is good. Do we sit at his feet and claim our place as Mary? Or do we keep the coffee going in the kitchen and answer the doorbell as did Martha? You know, doesn't make it wrong. I'm just saying that it's the difference in the outlook here. While interviewing for the new pastor, do we look for one that will visit, work, witness, and more, and give us at least 10 hours a day? Or would we hire one who candidly told us he would not be at the office before mid-morning on any day since he planned to spend the first two to three hours every day in prayer? Which candidate? There's a mystery about prayer. and We're into the mysterious ways of God and so there's mystery here about prayer. We pray and nothing seems to happen. Have you ever prayed and seemed like an answer just wouldn't come? Then we pray again and out of nowhere, all of a sudden, I mean, it might have been the 32nd time you prayed over that thing or it might have been the 132nd time. But all of a sudden, the prayer bell rings and God answers our request. So the scriptures show us a pattern here. First, God works in and around, through and with the medium of prayer. When we pray, he sends power. When we worship, he works in our behalf. So when we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. So the advice here, I guess, that they're trying to give to us is that we can't do it all just through our works. We need to take our burdens to the Lord in prayer. So when we pray, he sends power. When we worship, he works on our behalf. And so there's that personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's got to be a personal relationship again. Secondly, God, by prayer, works through us. Does prayer exempt us from the work of God? No, it doesn't, but prayer aligns us up with his purposes. 
so that he works in us and then through us. And do we see prayer as directing God or as discerning the will of God and learning to move with him? Prayer is asking God to align you with his will rather than asking him to be aligned with yours. And that's why we pray, hopefully in the spirit, and ask the Lord to answer prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He taught us how to pray. And so that doesn't mean we drop to our knees and say, you know, hey, Lord, it's Jimmy. I'll take all you give me. That's the prayer that, you know, the little boy said to his, his uh, pastor one day. Well, our prayer to the Lord should be more about our relationship with him. It should be a conversation, an ongoing conversation with the Lord. So we don't direct the traffic. We don't control God. We bring our cares to the Lord. guess that's how, to, how I'm trying to say it. Thirdly, God by prayer energizes us with his Holy Spirit. So the Spirit works by prayer, anointing us and releasing power in us and through us and ministers through us. So it is prayer that taps the energy source of the Spirit that gets released in my ministry. It is prayer that gets the energy source of the Spirit released. So when I put God first, God takes care of me and energizes me to do what really needs to be done. David Jeremiah. Fourthly, we see that formula. Somehow angels work in the matrix of prayer and the atmosphere that's created by it. So it was when the church was praying that an angel was commissioned to rescue Peter from prison and deliver him to the house where the saints had gathered. But it was when they were praying. God works. We work. His spirit works. Angels work. Or by the mystery of prayer, God works in us by the enabling of the Spirit in the context of angelic assistance. All kinds of dynamics are set in motion just by the very power of prayer. Again, there's power in prayer. Men work, they work, but when men pray, God works. So we see here the Old Testament prayer and incense. And in the Old Testament, the incense burned at the golden altar and that was a type of prayer. It was burned twice daily at the time of the morning and the evening sacrifice, which was an offering for consecration. At the same time, the lamps were replenished with oil and set on fire. The incense was a sweet fragrance that filled the holy place. So they did this twice daily, morning and evening, and it was a time of consecration to God. I still believe in that. I still believe that we need to recommit ourselves to the Lord. Let's look at the fire for the incense. It was taken from the brass altar. I don't know if you can see it up in the little picture uh, that well, but the fire was taken for the incense was taken from that brass altar in the court the altar of sacrifice for sin and consecration to God. And so it is always the fire of purity and godly purpose of life that lights the sweet aroma of my fellowship with God. So when we have fellowship with God, that is a sweet aroma that leaves us and it's heavenward bound. And he can smell the aroma, the sweet aroma of that fellowship. The fire of purity and godly purpose of life. Our lives are pure. We've set aside that we're going to live pure and holy and that there's going to be purpose, godly purpose, in what we do. It's prayer out of a heart that is holy and holy or fully committed to God that he counts as the sweet smell of our loving worship and prayer. And this kind of prayer results in the refilling of my life with the oil of the Holy Spirit. So you see here the tabernacle of Moses. You see the um, altar of burnt offerings and then the bronze laver uh, sanctification. You see the holy place where the table of showbread and the golden lampstand stood. And then over next was the altar of incense. And it was just outside 
of the most holy place. It was the last thing before entering into the most holy place was the altar of incense. There is where our prayer goes up. That odor, that sweet smell. This is another picture of it so that you can see it a little better, hopefully. The altar of burnt offering all the way through into the holy place. This is another side cut. Let's take a look in the tabernacle to see a picture of worship and prayer. So the golden altar stood before the veil, which the writer of Hebrews identified as the flesh of Christ, the body of Jesus. And behind the golden altar and to the north was the golden table loaded with bread, a symbol of the word. So now we have the flesh of Christ and we have the golden table loaded with bread or the word. And then we have the golden candlestick providing by the fuel of oil the only light that there was in the holy place. And that was a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So we have this picture of worship and prayer. Golden altar, the golden table, the golden candlestick, meaning the flesh of Christ, the bread or word, and his Holy Spirit. There's such uh, majesty in what he gives us to look at, such symbolic uh, things that he's showing us here. Let's survey our surroundings. We're standing at the altar, and that was the place of prayer. And then to our right, as we entered, is the golden table or the word. And to our left is the golden lampstand, a symbol of the Spirit. And so here are the implications of what we're seeing here. In front of us is the veil, Jesus. So we pray. Our incense is rising from the golden altar through the veil, Jesus, and according to the word, which is the table of showbread that's there, by the enabling of the Holy Spirit, which is the candlestick. So we have the veil, we pray through the veil, according to the word, and by the enabling of the Holy Spirit. So if we say we just can't do it, we're wrong, because he tells us that's not true just by this right here by the enabling of the Holy Spirit. Look beyond the veil is the Ark of the Covenant. And there's three things that are inside that Ark. And that, remember, that is the place of His glory. The rod is in there, a symbol of authority of office, and it calls for submission. The rod, submission, authority. And then we have the pot of manna, a symbol of provision by faith. Provision. He provided the manna, and he will provide for you and me. And then the tablets are in, a symbol of God's demand for righteousness. If it's important to God, it's important to us. If we are truly trying to live according to the word of God. And so the rod, authority, the pot of manna, or the, his provision by faith, and then the tablets, his demand for righteousness. So as we pray, we do so by faith, because it says, for without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we see here the, all of these elements that are in the Ark of the Covenant. We do so in submission, for it is a humble people that God will hear. If my people will humble themselves and pray. And he also says, God resist the proud. And so we as a nation and as a people and as a church, we must humble ourselves and pray. And we must pray out of righteousness because he said it is the effectual, fervent prayer of what kind of man? A righteous man that avails much. So the two pictures tell us, if my people humble, pray, seek, and turn. And then he gives us these formulas. The fervent prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So we see here by these scriptures 
that if we humble ourselves and pray, then he will answer us. All three of those symbols are covered by the mercy seat, Jesus, and our propitiation. These are the three primary elements of our covenant. First, first we have faith, which is manna. Their faith, they looked out the tent every morning, and there was the manna, faith. And then obedience, which was the rod, and righteousness, which was the tablets. They had to live by the tablets. Someone, I think I read today or recently, where somebody said, you know why they've got over, you know, 10,000 pages of laws on the books or whatever, 100,000 pages of law on the books? You know why they're there? Because people couldn't follow 10 rules on a tablet. So that's why they got all these laws that they've written up. I looked up the word propitiation, and it carries the basic idea of appeasement or satisfaction specifically towards God. So propitiation is a two-part act that involves appeasing the wrath of an offended person and being reconciled to him. So Jesus is our propitiation, and he is the one that did the two things for us. He... Um, took the wrath, and he brought us reconciliation. He helped us cross the bridge. There was no way you and I could ever be good enough for God to erase the sin that had been committed. But Jesus Christ is the one that took on that burden for you and me. So faith reminds us of our need to be rightly related to the Father's hand or provision and manna, faith. And then obedience reminds us that he is our head, the rod and submission. And then righteousness is the very condition of his heart, the tablets. And therefore, he longs to write his law upon our hearts so that we will cry out for holiness. In other words, we don't do it just to get by. We do it because our heart is about to explode within us because we love him so much. He loved us so much. How could we ever repay him? And so we cry out for holiness. We cry out for righteousness. We cry out for good instead of the wrong in our lives because of his very righteousness. His law, when it's written on our hearts, causes us to love, to be obedient to him, causes us to have faith in him and trust him even when we don't see his hand, even when we don't see the answer to the problem. We continue to put our faith and our trust and our confidence in him, and he'll never let you down. The manna from heaven, the rod of Aaron, the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments inside of the ark. The law was the way. The manna was uh, the, the truth. And the rod was the life. So we see here the criticality of the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus Christ became all of that for us. His covenant people are rightly related to his hand, manna, his heart, tablets, and his head, rod. They have faith for today, a heart cry for what is right and holy, and a mindset committed to submission and obedience. And all I could say there is, wow, a faith for today, a heart cry for what's right and holy, and a mindset I got, you know, the old folks used to say, I got a, a mind made up to make heaven my home. And uh, I used to, I could hide in the pew behind Sister Dale, and I knew what she was going to testify every Wednesday night. And as she would say it, I was mimicking her. You know, I could say every word just like she did. But I'll tell you one thing. The last time I saw her, she was sitting up in the bed, Indian style. She must have weighed, what, 300 pounds? And she was sitting up in the bed, Indian style, peeling an orange and eating it and laughing and wallowing that head. And if the Holy Spirit would hit her much, she would begin to shout and that hair would 
just whipped like a whip out behind her and the bobby pins would go everywhere and us children would pick them up at church brother dale would give us chewing gum so we would make sure we got them bobby pins up i think about that and i think about the way that they lived their life in expectation that the trump was about to sound and they were ready and you know mom and i walked out of her hospital room and it wasn't but just a very few hours later not even a day that we got a phone call sister dale passed away you know and uh you think to yourself oh my goodness what a shock she looked like she was getting along so good but had a massive heart attack and went to glory and you know i wrote someone this week they were um talking about something and i said well this is just a quick trip to glory you know that sometimes we act like we don't really want to go we're afraid he's going to call our number today you know and i'm not ready to you know to commit suicide i'm not i'm doing fine y'all but i'm just ready to leave this old world and get to my heavenly home can i get a witness because he's got something so great for us but he's not going to take us until we do what we're supposed to do he's given us a work to do he has given us a mission field he has given us a calling he's given us a task to complete and until we do that we got to keep on keeping on and so I think about this and I think about those that went before me like Essie Jethro and Mary Dale and uh, Gaither Bateman and all of those people that went before me and I saw it and I think to myself you know when brother Bradley come over to pray tonight he said you know God spoke to me this week and and so forth and so on and I want y'all to pray for my service over there tonight and I thought to myself Lord let it be a legacy just like I had passed to me stir up those kids and make them hungry for the word of God amen we have to be submissive and obedient let's look at uh, the lofty and noble path as being a narrow one He's covered the man, these demands with mercy. He himself has completed his covenant demands, fulfilling them in his son. But does that release us from faith, from obedience, and from righteousness? No, it doesn't. But what is so wonderful about it is, is that he didn't, uh, what is it Pastor Hudson used to say, tickle me. He said, I'll put a man right on that, Sister H., he says I'll put a man right on that and that's what I'm thinking here God didn't put just any old man on it he put Jesus Christ on it he's paid the way we have a free ticket all we have to do is to reach out and accept that free ticket as we experience his mercy we want to obey him we just want to because he's been so good to us as we taste the gift of his righteousness we long to walk with a guilt-free conscience. As we learn the power of faith, we ask him to increase our faith to believe all things are possible through him. So we're not of this world. We're just passing through. But we still live by grace. And when we fail in the production of our righteousness, he makes up the difference in mercy. How many times have you had to cry out to God for mercy? When we fail in faith and cry out, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief, he makes up the difference in mercy. And when we fail in obedience and then repent, humbling ourselves before him, he restores our fractured relationship. When we fail to be obedient, he and his grace are sufficient. He said in uh, 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so he doesn't beat us about the head and shoulders, but he reaches to us and restores our fractured relationship. Never should we exploit his mercy. As we pray at the altar of incense, by the enabling of the Spirit, represented by the lampstand, according to the word the table of showbread, to and through Jesus, the veil, our intercessor with faith, manna, and a disposition to righteousness, those tablets, and a willingness to submit to his will, which is the rod, we come under the covering of his mercy 
the mercy seat and the sprinkling of his blood and the impartation of his glory and the shadow of angels who assist us on our mission covering. Just think about that. The mercy seat, the sprinkling of his blood and his glory. The impartation of his glory. And that's what we see on our brothers and our sisters' faces. When God begins to move in their life and begins to answer prayer for them and causes a situation that looked hopeless and helpless to, to become answered and resolved, how good it is to see the unity and the fellowship because we recognize it. We see the glory of God on their face. All of this imagery of the tabernacle comes alive in our lives. It's not there to fill Old Testament space. It is the rich prophetic type of the reality that God longs to bring to his church even today. We know that he the word became flesh and he tabernacled among us. And that's where he is today. He resides with us. Amen. Are y'all excited about it? Are you excited that he really lives today and he lives in each and every one of us? And that he is willing to answer prayer he's willing to help us to be successful in his calling he's willing to help us in our quest for righteousness all of this imagery was left there to show us how important it is that we hunger and thirst for him we're to hunger and thirst for him, not out of some misplaced duty or drudgery or cause we got to do it, you know? There was a subject I hated. It was titled Problems of Democracy. All I cared about, they told me that you had to get a 70 and Miss Ray would pass you. I wanted a 70. That's all I wanted. Just get out of that woman's class. As I graduated high school, she talked to my mother. She saw something in me, and she wanted to talk to Mama about me going on and furthering my schooling. I don't know what she saw in me, but as I told my Sunday school class Sunday, see something in somebody and speak it into their life. Talk to people and let them know they are somebody. The reason I hated her class, y'all gonna love this because I was scared to get up in front of the class and make a presentation. So I'd take a zero on the presentation and I'd make a hundred on the, on the written part. Well, then that didn't give me but 50. So it was getting closer and closer to D-Day and I had, to, I had to get some more points so I was going to have to stand up in front of people. So it's Miss Nell Ray's fault y'all got me standing up here. But isn't it funny how we don't see within ourselves maybe that we really can do something and somebody else sees something in you and they will speak it into you and cause you to have a little faith. A model for prayer. There's an interesting model for prayer in the book of James. James 5 and 14 says, There is an interesting, or is any sick among you? Let him call for who? the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. First, the sick can mean anything from feeling weak to actually being impotent or diseased. Secondly, he initiates the healing process by requesting prayer himself. Let him call. He may not have a ton of faith, but if he can just raise his hand and get your attention and say, pray for me. But he's got to show some initiative. Let him call. Thirdly, it is not one person who he calls, but a group of elders 
He will receive ministry not from the hand of one, but out of the collective giftings and passion of the plural. Then they pray, then together they will pray over him. The imagery is of a bedfast man or one immobilized by illness. And the word pray is really the idea of prayer mixed with praise. It can mean worship as well as to pray. So they pray and praise and praise and pray. It is an atmosphere that is being created here, a context in which God can minister. This is not to be a hurried process. It's not to be a one-minute prayer. It's the picture deliberating, setting out to have a hearing with God. The word proskukome is a compound word. Pros means forward or to face or to head in the direction of. Yukomaya meaning to wish for something, to will something, and to want something. So the idea seems to be that prayer is the process whereby we all, by our focus and the direction of the Spirit, we all get headed in the same direction, wishing for the same thing, agreeing on the same desired outcome. This is not our will imposed on prayer, but the will of the Spirit born out of prayer. It is the picture of unity, of focus, and of faith. So we see again that unity or that harmony that we studied about in chapter 10. So fifthly, they anoint the sick man with oil. This is a symbolic action. It is oil that so often symbolizes the touch of the Holy Spirit. So just mere oil will not heal the man. But here the group acts out on earth symbolically what it longs to see God do from heaven. So come and touch this man with healing power by the activity of the Holy Spirit. This anointing is done in obedience with the expectancy driven by faith. So we must have an expectancy. Do we really believe and are we sold on and have we made up our mind to bring a healing spirit in the house? It is in an atmosphere of faith and obedience where God does his greatest work. And so that anointing oil is bringing us together in unity to see God touch this person. And he says in my name, the oil on the man is a symbol of the desire to see the Holy Spirit upon the man. The hand of the elders upon the man is a desire to see the hand of God there. So the horizontal and the vertical what? It comes together. Here, earth seeks to move in coordination with heaven. Suddenly, the sixth movement to this prayer event takes place. The prayer of faith now is being prayed. Before, there was an atmosphere of prayer and praise. Now, one voice begins to rise above the other voices. One voice is energized by the Spirit. And this prayer is a specific wish or desire. It is not prayer that is seeking God's direction. It is prayer that has discovered it. It knows God's direction now and declares it by the Spirit. It is also prayer driven by faith. The gift of faith, one of the manifestations of the Spirit, is at work here. Suddenly, we are now at a different level. The Holy Spirit is actively operating. It says faith grows through the fire. Seventh, the atmosphere of faith, that declaration of the Father's will that's been articulated by the anointed prayer brings a rush of power. The man is being raised up. He's being healed, restored, delivered, and set free. The power of anointed prayer. And then eighthly, the minister doesn't stop with the physical. The concern of the elders is that the man receives ministry at the spiritual and moral level as well. So there is ministry to any sins unconfessed, any guilt not covered by the blood, any trespass not repented of. The man is assured of the forgiveness of God 
for his sins. It says in James 5, 15, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. And finally, James urges the confession of sins one to another and prayer for healing. So out of the overflow of the moment, one can conceptualize elders praying one for another or those on a ministry team begin to enjoy a moment of healing for themselves after they have waded into the stream of his presence to see a brother or sister raised up. So now in the overflow, we joy in his presence. All of a sudden, we get healed ourselves. Isn't that how it is so often? As we minister to others, God fills our baskets. How many times have we prayed for another individual and God literally answered our heart's cry? Something that maybe we had been really burdened about. But we weren't praying about it right then. We were worried about our brother or a sister. And we were focused on them and we were praying them through. And all of a sudden, that knowledge, that knowing that you know, all of a sudden you know that God has heard your cry. And that your prayer has been answered. It may be a while before you see it physically with your own eye, but you have the assurance. And I'll tell you, there is nothing like knowing that God has heard your prayer and that nothing the enemy can do can stop what's going to take place. God is going to answer our prayers. We're going to see things happen that we don't, we can't even imagine or think of. If we will just just bring ourselves to the place to where we are concerned about our brother and our sister. We are more worried about them than we are about our own immediate need. I think I shared this one time before, but I was at the airport and I didn't know someone that I knew was around me. And I had a backpack on and all of a sudden my backpack got real light. Something happened and it kind of shocked me, and I looked around, and there was somebody that I knew, and they had held up my backpack just to make the uh, burden light. And I knew who the individual was. And it seemed like that spiritually, when I was on the plane, the Lord began to deal with me about that very thing. We can carry our burden. We can carry our load. But when a friend comes along and lifts that load, it gives us a breather. And that's what the church is all about. The church joins together and we help one another to carry the burden and to carry the load. Yeah, he settled that backpack back on my back. I had to haul it some more. But for a moment in time, the weight was lifted. And there's nothing like it when God delivers our burden. God delivers our cares. You know, Jeff, when uh, the doctor had said to us uh, that it's Hodgkin's or lymphoma and we have to continue testing and so forth, and it was the first afternoon, and they had canceled my surgery and sent me back home to wait um, for the results of the uh, scans and so forth. And we were trying to wrap our head around everything that they had told us that afternoon. And I was lying on the couch, and I think Larry on the recliner. And Jeff walks up on our deck and taps on the door. And he come in, and he stayed hours. I mean, at first I thought, okay, Jeffro, time to go on back to the house, brother. Because I didn't know how I felt, and I, I, I needed time to sort. He didn't talk. In fact, I didn't talk. Larry would talk with him for a few minutes, and then they'd sit there for an hour and wouldn't say anything. Then all of a sudden, they'd start talking again. And during that period of time, God used Jeff to strengthen Larry. We never know the burden whose backpack we're lifting. We never know what we're doing in the kingdom of God for somebody else until given the opportunity to hear a testimony at some time later as to what God really did for that person. So don't discount yourself as to what your ministry is. Not everybody is called 
to preach from the pulpit. Many of us are called to live righteous lives and to pray for other individuals, to speak faith into their life, and to give strength where we can. But God's got to work for every single one of us, and one is no greater than the other. We're all on this team together. We're all rowing in the same direction. And all we need is to get together and worship together, strengthen ourselves as we go out and do more for the Lord. Amen. The rest of the lesson, I'm supposed to read you the entire Psalm 104. It is really long, and it's 824, so I'm not sure I would make it all the way through even if I tried, but I'm going to read a couple of the verses. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind, who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers of flaming fire, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. Thou coveredst it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains, and at thy rebuke they fled. At the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. They go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys unto the place which thou hast founded for them. Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over, that they turn not again to cover the earth. He sendeth the springs into the valleys which run among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild asses quench their thirst. By them shall the fowls of the heaven have their habitation which sing among the branches. He watereth the hills from his chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man that he may bring forth food out of the earth and wine that maketh glad the heart of man and oil to make his face to shine and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon which he hath planted, where the birds make their nest, as for the stork, the fir trees are her house. The high hills are a refuge for the wild goats, and the rocks for the conies. He appointed the moon for seasons, the sun knoweth his going down. Thou makest darkness, and it is night, wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth. The young lions roar after their prey, and seek their meat from God. The sun arises Riseth. They gather themselves together and lay them down in their dens. Man goeth forth unto his work and to his labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. So is this great and wide sea wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. These wait all upon thee, that thou mayest give them their meat in due season. That thou givest them they gather, thou openest thine hand, they are filled with good. Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die and return to their dust. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. The glory of the Lord shall endure forever. The Lord shall rejoice in his works. He looked on the earth and it trembleth. He touches the hills and they smoke. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. Let the sinners be consumed out of the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless thou the Lord, O my soul. Praise ye the Lord. And that is the end of our study on the mysterious ways of God. Um, just a quick reminder, when we started this series, this is my last slide, we started this series back in chapter 1. Remember we talked about there were three classifications defining the nature of our faith. One was a natural uh, liberal church was the one that would go with that nature and then secondly was a rational faith much of the evangelical fundamentalist and classical Pentecostal churches uh, in other words the emphasis on rational elements if I can explain it then I'll believe it if I can't explain it then I, I'm not going to have anything to do with it then thirdly uh, the uh, definition or classification I should say is mystery 
This was God's emerging church. Faith is the anchor of objective truth and the less easily perceived realm of the spirit, which is increasingly unwrapped as we experientially discover the mysterious ways of God. What was the purpose? The purpose of us studying this was number three. There are times when God will answer and there's no rational way to explain it. And yet we must, as a church, understand the mysterious ways of God. This is God's emergent church. Our faith is anchored on objective truth, just a little less easily perceived. And it's in the spirit world. It's the working of the spirit man, which is increasingly unwrapped as we discover these mysterious ways of God. So the closer we walk to God the more we're willing to take a look at those things that he has to share with us. If we can't explain it, Brother Steve, sometimes we have to understand it, that it's the mysterious ways of God. Amen? All right, I'll let you go. It is 8.30, and um, let's see. Brother Abby, if you will say our dismissal prayer. Father, we just thank you for this word this night. We just take it now that you would put, uh, bless our, our lives with this word. Go with us now as we depart from here. Lord, keep your protecting hand upon us, and we just give you the praise and all in the name of Jesus. Amen.